As good as it was to be back on Earth enjoying seaside breezes and warm sun rays, no one on board had exactly been allowed to leave the ship yet. However, now that Captain Global's report was ready to hand deliver to the High Command, he and Lieutenant Commander Lisa Hayes endeavor on a classified mission to command HQ and board a military plane leaving the warmth of the South Pacific for the chilliness of Alaska. The girls on the bridge lament, watching them go, with Kim and Sammy wishing they could get off the ship. Claudia tells them to look on the bright side, reminding them just how cold Alaska is this time of year. They are interrupted by their temporary new captain, as Colonel Maestroff maintains tradition by banging his head on the low hatch as he enters the bridge, an indication of how rarely he makes it up there. He relishes his command position, short-lived as it will be, talking big and strutting around like he owns the whole ship, all the while Claudia slyly taking sarcastic shots at his ineptitude, as he engages in another tradition on the bridge. There's no smoking on the bridge, sir! What? It's on page two of the ship's rule book, isn't it, sir? Of course, I was only holding it. I have no intention of lighting it. Excuse me, Colonel. I request permission to leave the bridge. What? Yes, sir. You see, I've just ended my shift. Oh. Go right along there, Officer Grant. I'm sure we'll be able to operate just fine until you get back. Claudia, why don't you check in later anyway, just to make sure the bridge is still here? Hang in there, girls. <laughs> Meanwhile, on top of the Daedalus carrier, an ongoing festival is being had by the citizens of Macross City. And nobody is partying harder than Mayor Tommy Lewin, who, in a touching moment, expresses gratitude to the vessel and crew who kept he and his people safe from the Zentradi. And secretly, the three Zentradi spies learn of the Micronians' varied mixed beverages as they try their best to mix in with the crowd. As for Claudia, she knows how she'd like to celebrate, and the fact that she clearly has a key to Roy Foker's apartment speaks to the level of their relationship. But Roy's soft snores speak to his level of exhaustion. And yet, this ace pilot is never too tired to fly his girl on a special mission. Rick Hunter also prepares for a special mission of his own as he and the flight mechanics go over the checklist for his new fan jet. The very same fan jet won by Minmay when she was crowned Miss Macross. The mechanic tells him he's not only lucky to be leaving the ship, but spending time with its new beautiful celebrity as well. Wonder if she's changed much. Well, this is quite a turnout for you, Minmay. Yes. I suppose these mobs are part of the price one must pay for fame. Rick is rather taken aback at the pure adulation this crowd is giving Minmay, but is excited for her. As he helps her inside, she comments that he seems so much nicer and more gentlemanly than when they first met. He takes the compliment well, but Minmay's manager quickly gets in his face to remind him just how important his passenger is. Minmay vouches for Rick. After all, there's really no one else she'd feel more safe with, and the manager finally slinks off to let them get on their way. As the fan jet purrs, Rick hits the throttle, and away they go. Rick is elated to be on this adventure with Minmay, but accidentally vocalizes his adoration of her. She almost heard him, but he distracts her with a little fancy stunt flying, just like his good old days at the flying circus. It's then he's met by some familiar fighters out on patrol. Having fun, Min May? <laughs> Air tech escort approaching at five huh? o'clock. Hey, Lieutenant, it's Ben and Max. We understand you have a VIP aboard. We're heading back to the ship. Have a nice date. <laughs> So long, wise guys. See you later. Max and Ben are silly, but it does sort of feel like a date. Yep. <sighs> oh, it's great to get away, but when I get back, I have a whole lot of...
lot of work to make up. Although Minmei is excited to see her parents, she lists off all the events, TV shows, and even a movie she's due to star in. Rick listens politely, but it's clear he resents this busy schedule since it keeps the two of them from progressing very far together. Minmei is rather oblivious to his chagrin, as she says she maybe can get Rick a small role in her movie. <laughs> what would that be like? I'd be exhausted trying to keep up with a schedule like that one. Huh? What? Uh, Minmei, are you all right? Speak to me! Well, how do you like that? She's asleep. Hmm. <laughs> so much for their date. The flight for the captain and his first officer isn't nearly as thrilling. They approach Alaska Base, a vast, mostly underground complex and receive clearance to land and descend into the base itself. Traveling several miles through its expanse, Captain Global takes this opportunity to explain the workings of the base to Lisa, who had never been to it before. Even as an admiral's daughter, Lisa was kept in the dark about most of the classified top secret aspects of the base, including, the captain tells her, knowledge of the Grand Cannon, an enormous weapon making up the entire center of the base. A project that Lisa's own father headed, she finds out, as Global explains. Who else was there? He was the visionary. He pushed for the creation of this complex when no one else thought it was necessary. My father was responsible for all this? I didn't know that. Your father has always been very decisive. When we were serving together, a problem came up once about inadequate rations for the men. When he couldn't get any action from headquarters, he ordered our entire division to raid the food supplies of the commanding general. <laughs> My father got away with that? Really, it's true. <laughs> I can hardly believe it. <laughs> the general thought spies had infiltrated the regiment. He kept sending down orders for us to find them. It's good to hear you laugh again, Commander. I think this is the first time I've heard you laugh since you escaped from the enemy. Huh? Um... But I wonder if we'll feel much like laughing after this meeting with the governing council. It's crucial they be made to understand the aliens are only interested in the battle fortress and its secrets, not in our world. I hope you've thoroughly prepared your arguments, Commander Hayes. I'm ready to go, Captain. Hmm, that's good. I'm sure we'll be able to convince them. After all, we're the only ones who've had close contact with the aliens. Attention. Smoking in this capsule is forbidden. Huh? Please put out your tobacco immediately. Can't I smoke anywhere anymore if it's not <laughs> my bridge officer's warning me it's these machines? <clears throat> Captain, are you worried about the ship? Is something going to happen to us? Why do you ask? When something's bothering you, I notice you always pull out your pipe and start to light it. Hmm. I must confess I'm very worried about this meeting. I'm not sure these men will listen to us with open minds, and it's vital to our future that they do so. What will happen if we can't convince them? The Earth will go to war against the aliens. <laughs> Suddenly, the prospect of facing these top generals felt more like a descent to hell to face the devil. Global hoped that this meeting would at least result in the allowance of the tens of thousands of civilians from Macross Island to receive permission to disembark and return to their families here on Earth. At that point, he would happily leave with the SDF-1, possibly even consider an exchange with the Zentradi giving them the ship in return for guaranteed safety of the Earth and its people. Whatever it took to prevent all-out war with this aggressive and powerful enemy. It all rested on Lisa's account of the enemy's power and capabilities, and whether they could convince this council, which included Lisa's own father, to seek peace with the Zentradi, or face an indomitable aggressor. As Rick and Minmei approach Yokohama, Japan, he rouses her from sleep, pointing out Mount Fuji as they close in near Tokyo Bay. Minmei takes in the smells and sights of her childhood, but quickly grows frustrated at Rick's lack of enthusiasm, wondering if anything impresses this flyboy. Entering Chinatown, Minmei is glad the neighborhood hasn't changed much. 
considering she herself has quite a bit. They arrive at the Golden Dragon, the sister restaurant of her Aunt Lena's White Dragon in Macross City. She rushes in giving a bright-eyed hello to the busboy Chang, who seems very alarmed as he quickly brings Min Mei's mother to her. Chang, do you recognize me? Look, who am I? Look, see, he doesn't Missy, know. He does what? Look! So, oh. Do you recognize me? <gasps> does that mean you do? Min Mei, we were sure you'd been killed. No, I'm home. Oh, oh I can't oh. believe it. Our darling little girl is home. She wasn't taken from us. Well, I was, but they brought me back. Huh? Back from where and who's this? This is Rick, Mother. He's the boy who saved my life. <gasps> oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, young man. Uh, well, uh, gee, I really don't know what to say. Min May. Oh? We thought you were dead. If you were alive, why didn't you even try to contact us? Hmm? They thought she was dead. Rick could now see why he was ordered to keep a low profile with Min May, despite their special permission to make the ship's VIP celebrity happy. The military on board the ship knew it was extremely important to keep Lin Minmei in high spirits, as she could be the key in making sure their thousands of civilian guests didn't one day become a mob if things didn't go their way. However, at least in the novels, Rick had been ordered to make sure this visit was kept under wraps from the rest of the world, and that Minmei's parents would be sworn to absolute secrecy but Rick hadn't been told why exactly. He didn't have to be a genius to realize that the rest of the world must think that Macross Island and anyone on it must now be dead. Therefore, he decided he better just sit back and say as little as possible during Min Mei's little family reunion. As Lisa finishes giving her full report, this council looks at it as dubiously as the generals aboard the SDF-1 did. She lamented once again losing that video recorder. That was a very complete report, Lieutenant Commander Hayes, but come now, don't you think you've overestimated the enemy's strength by quite a lot? Yes, I can't help but wonder why the enemy didn't destroy the battle fortress if they have the strength you say. I've already explained why they didn't in my report. You expect us to accept that report as the truth? Oh. That's all, Commander. We've all heard quite enough. You may sit down. Admiral, I... Shh. Oh. Gentlemen, what about the authorization for the requests that were attached to that report? The negotiation plans and the relocation of the 70,000 survivors. We'll discuss your requests at our next regularly scheduled meeting. Oh, I can't believe they treated us like this. I do. I think we've lost the fight. But how can you already know that? There's something going on here we don't know about. Their minds are made up. Oh, I wonder what they're planning to do with us. Min Mei's visit with her own father isn't going much better than Lisa's. Mom and Dad refused to let Min Mei go back to the SDF-1 since they only just found out she's still alive. She yells at them about how she has a career she'd always dreamed of there, is an important person, and tries to drag Rick in to back her up as he remains rather speechless. Her parents plan for Min Mei to get married one day and take over the restaurant and nearly betroth her to Rick on the spot, offering such a deal. As tempting as it is, he wisely remains neutral. Just then, some dude comes down the stairs to see what all the yelling is about, and Rick seems rather jealous when Min Mei greets this Kyle with a giant hug. Turns out, it's his parents who own the restaurant in Macross, but he joined the peace movement, protesting war, so he thought it was best to move away from the world's new, super-dimensional battle fortress. But when he'd heard the entire island was destroyed, he moved in with Min Mei's parents to continue his work and studies. When I tried to go back for a visit, I couldn't get a boat. They told me everything on the island had been destroyed. It was terrible. Well, I'm glad you're here, even though you're the only one who made it. But your mom and dad are doing just fine running their business. Huh? What? They're alive? Sure, silly. They're on the ship. They're where? They're on the spaceship. You mean you didn't know? What? No! <laughs> Most of us survived. This is Lieutenant Hunter. He's one of the fighter pilots from the ship. Oh. Hello. Hello. Rick, this is my cousin Lynn Kyle, who's been like a brother to me. Kyle, Rick is the one who saved my life. It was a privilege to do it. I thought soldiers were expected to aid civilians in times of emergency. Uh, <clears throat> but we appreciate your efforts anyway. 
When Rick came along and saved my life, he hadn't become a soldier yet. So you decided to join up later, huh? That's right. What do you think's so good about the military? Huh? <laughs> yes, this Kyle is every bit as delightful as you think he's gonna be. On the plus side, he does actually agree with Minmei that she be allowed to return to the SDF-1 and continue on living her dream. But under the condition that he go with her and keep an eye on her, which also allows him to see his folks. Oh, Rick is absolutely ecstatic at the prospect of this guy weaseling his way into Minmei's life. Back in Alaska, the Council reconvenes with Global and Lisa, but the outlook isn't good. Although they find most of the report to be accurate, they side on the idea that their fully functioning Grand Cannon will protect the planet just fine and see no reason to give any leverage to the aliens in negotiations. They would rather use the SDF-1 as a decoy as they enhance their understanding of robotechnology and build up their forces for war. What's more, Global finds his request to allow the civilians to leave the ship is denied. The Council finally informs them they've kept the knowledge of the giant aliens attacking Earth a secret from the world, so as not to cause mass panic. And the destruction of Macross Island was done by anti-unified government terrorists. Since the crew and civilians had all officially been declared dead, the SDF-1 and all hands aboard are ordered back into space immediately. The Council is even so callous as to suggest that, if Lisa's report on the fascination of Earthling behavior is accurate, it would be a good thing to have an entire city on board. Despite the truth to that, Lisa calls on her father to compel him to reconsider this, and Admiral Hayes quickly rebukes the lieutenant commander for trying such a ploy. It's crucial you draw the enemy forces away from this planet. At what expense? Captain, we're not insensitive to your situation, but we must have time to strengthen our defenses and increase our knowledge of robotechnology, and you're the only ones who can give it to us. Father, this is too much to ask of all those civilians. Commander Hayes, we may be father and daughter, but while we're here, I expect to be addressed according to my rank. Do you understand? After Global tries one more desperate appeal to avoid any semblance of war, the Council abruptly, officially, ends the meeting, putting an end to the debate, with Lisa and the captain having lost this battle. Lisa, wouldn't you like to spend some time with your father while you're still here? As family, I mean. No, sir, I have no particular interest in seeing him right now. Hmm. I understand, my dear. It is notable that her father does at least try and reach out to her, having passed along a private letter to her before she and the captain head back to the battle fortress. My dearest Lisa, I know that you're angry about my decision regarding the ship, but it was unavoidable under the circumstances. I want you to try to understand and realize that I'm concerned about your welfare. The battle fortress is a very dangerous place and I'm working on getting you reassigned to another ship. Rick finds himself having to tolerate the presence of Kyle, made worse by the fact that he's stuffed in the back seat with Minmei on his lap. That was kind of their thing, after all. The fact that they are so flagrantly flirty with each other calls into question just how closely related they actually are. But trust me that from here on out, it's best not to think too hard about it. Unfortunately for Rick, He's stuck bearing witness to their constant banter the whole way back, which seems particularly unfair since she slept the whole way when it was just the two of them. Two planes head back towards the SDF-1, from two different directions and two very different missions, both of which seem to have ended in defeat.